Welcome to Studio One. If you like what you see, like and subscribe and comment. How are you doing today? It's it's Mike. Yeah, it's Mike. Uh, pretty good. I'm kind of feeling FOMO from the sun. It's a perfect oh, day. Yeah. yeah. I feel you on that one. It's been a very like gray and cool spring. I was uh, researching you, and uh, <clears throat> I really like how one of your Instagram is PP Online. <laughs> that's true that's so there's a story there my grandma used to call me pee pee that was her nickname for me so Aww. yeah that's uh <laughs> that's why that's my instagram handle surprisingly wholesome yeah yeah so i'm mike i'm from uh studio one we're a toronto platform to interview artists from all walks of life thank you for coming on can you please introduce yourself yeah, thanks. I'm Pete Moss, and I'm a children's musician and outdoor educator in Toronto. So are you born and raised in Toronto? No, I was born in London, Ontario, and then I grew up in Kitchener, Waterloo, and I moved to Toronto in 2011. Okay, so fairly yeah. recent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, did you spend your childhood in Kitchener, Waterloo? I did, yeah. Um I, yeah, grew up right on the border of Kitchener and Cambridge. I went to high school in Cambridge, Ontario, in a, in a small sort of town within Cambridge called Preston. Mm. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess all we know about is just like trips to uh, see Shakespeare. That's <laughs> yeah. all we know about Cambridge, Toronto kids. Um, was it like a small town or well, it doesn't seem like a small town. So I think you're thinking of Stratford, which is close by to Cambridge, Um, but Cambridge has like a similar vibe. Um, Cambridge is like, is three small towns amalgamated Mm. within Kitchener-Waterloo, which is three small cities amalgamated, kind of. Um, But yeah, it's, I would say it's a similar vibe to Stratford. yeah, hard to, it's, it's, it's really pretty. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's hard, it's hard to, hard to sum up mm. <laughs> Cambridge. Fair yeah. Yeah. So how did you get your, uh, get your start in music education? So I was on a path like of being, of like working with children um, and I became an outdoor educator around 2014. And around that time, I was also um, in an indie rock band and it was called Blimp Rock. Um, and yeah, I, I kept that going for, for a while. Um, and then I guess it was in 2019, I kind of decided to like combine both those worlds of like outdoor education and music um, with this Pete Moss project. Cool. Yeah. Mm. So what, uh, which early childhood educators and shows made a big impact on you? Uh, Like Fred Penner and Raffi for sure. Um, Like, um, like Raffi's albums, I can listen to like, as an adult and just enjoy them so much. And I think like Fred Penner's show, like if you ever like YouTube clips from that show, it's just like, it's, it's super magical. Um, And yeah. And I think like, and he, I think was really passionate about connecting kids to to nature and the magic of nature. And so um, that is, yeah, definitely some inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, your sister, uh, Jacqueline, she's a children's book, ed- uh, children's book author. So does uh, childhood education run in the family? Yeah, I guess like, yes, because Jacqueline is in, started as a poet and is now also a, a children's author. Um, and my, I have two other sisters and one sister is a teacher and my other sister is a therapist uh so like similar similar veins of work for sure 
yeah Good listeners yeah i mean J- like jacqueline's book is awesome too like the um it's the uh like her last children's book is is really special mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i was listening to your song i don't know if this is her last book but uh your song it's okay to be quiet yeah mm-hmm. uh, hit me a lot because um uh, i always saw myself as an introvert now I don't think people see me as an introvert because I'm such a blabbermouth, but uh, it did hit me uh, in a deeper level. I think that there's a lot of, like, you can be a blabbermouth and be an introvert. Those mm-hmm. things are not mutually exclusive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So have you thought of publishing your own children's book? I would love to do that. Um, I haven't pursued it in any serious way. Um, I definitely have made children's books for fun Mm -hmm. um, and enjoy doing it. Yeah, certainly something I'm, I'm interested um, in doing one day, but currently I'm focused on other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, So I think one of your biggest uh, priorities is being an outdoor outdoor educator at uh, Evergreen Brickworks. I visited it during the pandemic a couple months ago. Have you been back? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, my full-time job is at Evergreen and um, I think all, all of my formative days as a, as an outdoor educator were spent in that park behind Evergreen. And so I have a very much have a connection to it and, and feel like I know, um, yeah, like know it pretty well and know where certain animals tend to hang out and, yeah, it's 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 a special place for sure. So, isn't um, this is just me speculating? But isn't outdoor education technically safe enough to for for I guess parents and teachers to pursue? Or is it? Have you done any of those recently? Yeah, I think like like if we went from like just science and like. Uh, it would technically probably be pretty safe. Um, but the work that we do um, legally falls under camps, um, which are currently not permitted by the province. So I'm going to jump on more childhood education stuff and connect it to my own life. So mm-hmm. this is might be a long question, but I'm going to sound like a hip hop old head. But I think <laughs> the cartoons I grew up on 15, 20 years ago are just better than the watered down stuff they have now like spongebob teen titans they used to have more grit they have Mm -hmm. more serious tone talk about some real issues but now even spongebob and teen titans they're more colorful they're more one-dimensional and even disney cartoons uh, just feels a little devoid of death Uh, do you relate to this or am i not looking deep enough (laughs) that's such a good question I'm trying to think of like I don't feel like I have a ton of experience with cartoons contemporary cartoons I watched cartoons as a kid a lot and I agree they had some grit and I really like that um and I think I try to make uh kids music that has a bit of grit as well um I will say that like kids stuff that I do consume like I would say that I watch most of the the Pixar movies that come out and I do really enjoy those and and think there is a level of emotional intelligence and depth that that like is even maybe was somewhat missing in some of the stuff I saw as a kid so um, I will plug that I saw Soul recently and it was really really touching really really beautiful movie I was uh yeah I like it's always like because movie theaters closed a long time ago it's like soul is always on my watch list mm-hmm. well, um it seems like is it is it about loss what what are the themes of i didn't really look into soul yeah good question it's i think it's about like finding it's about the meaning of life i mm-hmm. think um and it explores that through someone who I, I don't think it's a spoiler to like for you to know that like he's he dies for a at some point and so it like explores the meaning of life through through someone going to an afterlife yeah yeah so I guess 
the move the movies and the the I guess the slightly older children's uh, films and television. There there's there's still good stuff out there. You just gotta look at the just look at the right places, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, I at least know there's that good thing and some maybe some other good Pixar movies, but um, I also don't want to invalidate what you said because I think that there's some there is some truth to it. Yeah. So as I get older, uh, I realize that the effect my parents' parenting had on me, I believe children can be taught important lessons like personal finance at a really young age. And I think they can grasp advanced concepts. So what are the most important lessons children should be taught today? Oh, wow. I love that you said personal finance. I think that on a personal level, that is something that I so badly wish that I was taught um, and still need to be taught. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think that's really missing. I think like, um, um, like relationships and like, um just yeah just all the like emotional stuff I think we could do we could do a better job at like teaching in that I've been in therapy for a lot of years and that's something that's been helpful for me emotionally and as a person and I just think of some of the lessons and things I learned through that like knowing when you're getting triggered by something and knowing like um like when um I don't know, like when, like how to like think about the things you've done and knowing that things in the past can, can stay with us. Like I, those are things I did not really grasp growing up or understand. So that would be great. And then like from an outdoor education standpoint, I think the most important thing to me is can we build a relationship between kids and, and not just nature, but, but local nature because um for myself as a kid like I grew up knowing a lot of like learning and seeing a lot of media related to like tigers and lions and like animals from across the world but um I think if we can like uh teach kids and build a relationship between like what is actually in their communities like foxes and eagles and hawks then it'll help them care about it more yeah yeah that's that's a really great answer yeah so i realized in recent years a lot of children's behaviors come from mirroring their parents myself included so is is educating and healing the parents just as important as educating the children oh so much so um a big part of my job is like teaching teachers and teaching educators and I think that there's a lot of like unlearning that has to happen in there's this like kind of amazing study out of the UK that like explores childhood range, like through generations and our great grandparents could go like four kilometers and then our grandparents like two kilometers and then our parents like one kilometer and then we finally get to like kids nowadays and it's like maybe a backyard or maybe like Mm -hmm. down the street. so yeah, I think at, at, at some point, I'm not sure when it was totally, but there was like kind of this movement and to like make childhood as safe as possible. Um, and that is not great for child development because um, when we wrap our kids in bubble wrap, they can't like fall down and, and learn to get back up and um, kind of build that resilience. So yeah, I think what, what we try to shift them or like educate is like shifting towards as safe as necessary rather than as safe as possible. Um, So just uh, always keeping in mind that like risks can be a healthy part of development. Yeah, I do this on a smaller scale, but growing up, I just kind of listened to my parents. I I didn't really think for myself. And now that I'm starting to think for myself, I kind of just rebel aggressively like I just like eat whatever I want do whatever I want like there's a lot of that so exactly like you said it's 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 like too safe when when uh, we were parented and now that we have some freedom people like me are going to just go full out insane 
were you part of the generation that was being bubbled up? It was like a mix. Um, you know, I think like, um, I was, uh, I had a little bit of like bubbling that was happening with me and have kind of worked, tried to work through that. But um, I also have, was given a lot of freedom as well. I did have like a forest that was close to where I grew up that um, I was, I think through some like, um, I don't know, like clever spinning maybe on, on my part and the other kids, like we were allowed to go pretty far in that forest. So yeah, that was, that was great. I have really positive uh, memories of that. Do you have any stories? Cause I know this isn't really about forest, but <laughs> I saw a video recently that, um, I forgot where this is like Amer the States or something like in the, like deep, deep forests there's like stories of like spiritual creatures and like this mm. air that goes into heaven or a different dimension or something. Do you have any like crazy stories from the forest or is it a place that you still go back to, to, you know, collect about your childhood? And stuff? Oh yeah. Like all the time. I think like the forest is, is my, it still feels like a really magical place. And I think, um, even though I live in downtown, there is um, this amazing park, the Leslie Spit, Tommy Thompson, um, that really is like a pretty wild area. And um, I think just something that has like stayed with me recently is I've been trying to learn uh, different bird songs and sounds. Um, and just like, honestly, like like walking into the, into the forest, like especially now when the birds are are migrating um it is like it is like um like an amazing electronic music track it's like there's just like this like all these sounds and like it's like it's like so dynamic and there's like kind of like a bass line that's like you know it's just it's it's really special so been enjoying the music of the forest mm -hmm. and is that how you were inspired to make a whole project about uh birds <clears throat> i think like birds um for me it was it was kind of the thing in outdoor education like that just <clears throat> for whatever reason like it just sparked something and I, I just I just ran with it and got kind of obsessed with birds um so it, it's 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 that but it's also just been maybe since 2014 just like really getting more and more obsessed with birds um and 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 plants as well and that was the last album and um and this one's about birds yeah yeah so we'll, we'll go back into your project but got more got more questions about childhood education uh so kids nowadays are diving deeper into the internet more than ever and earlier than ever especially now going out of the house and making friends in person literally risks spreading a deadly illness so is there any early childhood education on online safety that you've seen? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it's, that's not something that I'm, I'm familiar with or have come across, but it's something like the finance thing that you mentioned that would be super, super helpful. And for like the, my, my parents' generation, they're not very safe online either, uh, judging by the email chains that I get forwarded. So yeah. <laughs> yeah so i guess we all yeah other than the people that are um essentially addicted to the internet we all needed a needed new education yeah <laughs> yeah yeah don't click links and emails that you don't know who they're from <laughs> yeah my mom the other day is like why is my calendar full of like garbage links i'm like you got you got hacked like yeah 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 exactly yeah so do kids today actually use the child version of apps? Like, I, mean, mm. I kind of, because you're an elder educator, I figured they probably all run you around with phones now. And uh, so, but growing up, I was curious about everything and even generations before us. Uh, so is there really a way to stop the kids from going online, seeing, looking into things that might not be appropriate? Is there, mm. are they actually using the, the child version of these apps? Yeah, it's a good question. I think in at, at Evergreen, we don't actually allow kids to use phones. So mm -hmm. 
Um, so I'm sort of lucky and I will say that there is something kind of amazing, which is like, even though there's a lot of technology addiction and like everyone's on technology, it's like, it's kind of amazing how quickly like people can kind of like, like re recover mm -hmm. from that in a way, especially kids, they just like, um, so there's that. But then I think as far as the kid version of apps, like I have limited experience, but some of the, like I said, we do some train some educators and some of the educators that we train use an app called iNaturalist, which essentially like lets you take a photo of anything you see, a plant or uh, an animal or an insect, and it'll offer suggestions of for the identification. And there's a kid version of that called Seek um, that I've definitely seen kids and educators get into. Um, and, and, and just anecdotally, like YouTube kids, I do see small, <laughs> small children uh, use pretty often. So your work focuses on embracing the environment. Do children seem to care more about the environment than previous generations? The teens, the teenagers seem to, um, but do you see that in kids? Are they thinking differently now? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, I hope so. <laughs> I, I like, I do feel hopeful. I do, I know that like, I've seen a huge shift definitely in terms of indigenous knowledge mm. and understanding and, like a much more deep understanding than just like um, what I grew up with. Um, and I wanna say the same things are happening with climate change. I think there is like a, there is certainly like a like recognition that that is a, is a big problem. I think what I'd love to see more of, and I don't necessarily know the answer as to how we go about that is like, often like kids are quick to sort of be like, the solution is like renewable energy or this, like, like something like that when I would love if we could like somehow empower them to think about it a little bit more like systematically, like climate change is like really, really complicated and it's linked to like thousands of things and we can't just like solve it like that. So how do we actually make like systematic change in society? Um, yeah, so if you have any ideas for that, <laughs> let me know. <laughs> yeah. I'm, that's a, uh, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, yeah. Sounds good. But so what is the greatest environmental concern to you right now and how are the countries addressing it i mean i th i think i think it's climate change i i don't i don't know enough about it so i, I think i will like spotlight um another issue which is the the disappearance of birds many bird species um are on a sharp decline um if like the vast majority of them, there was an article in the New York Times um, in 2019 that we've uh, lost uh, over 3 billion birds um, from a, a, a number of factors, uh, whether it be they're crashing into windows or, uh, or, or planes or uh, they've lost their habitat. Um, and birds are really important for our uh, ecology um, because they spread seeds um, and they pollinate um, and they also eat a lot of annoying stuff like gnats and mosquitoes mm -hmm. and things like that so um, I would love to see like more of a recognition um, of that problem um, I, I definitely know there's like a lot of amazing organizations working to raise awareness about about it and act against it. But um, yeah, I would love to see um, like government uh, take a more active role mm -hmm. in helping helping out the birds. Yeah, because so I guess several years ago now, the bees were a huge concern essentially globally and that caught the attention of a lot of different people. And uh, from, I guess, anecdotally, it has recovered the, the bee. 
I don't, I'm not sure how the bees are doing. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've, my instinct is that it's, it still remains a problem and mm -hmm. that it, it's one that um, might also be linked to a lot of different things like climate change. So yeah, we got to mind our birds and our bees, Mike. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I really like how calm and stil stylistically matching the animation videos for uh, Sting, Nettle, and Dandelion. How did that collaboration come along with you and the animator? Yeah, so um, I went to high school in Cambridge, Ontario with a fellow named Parker Bryant. Um, and he is an uh, animator he, he always drew growing up. Um, he was always a painter, always drawing funny stuff and showing it to me in class. Um, and yeah, so he's now an, a professional animator. He works on a show called Total Drama Island, which I think now is like Total Drama Rama on the Cartoon Network. Mm. Um, so I'm very lucky to have access to him, his animation skills at a discounted rate, which is very <laughs> generous of him. So yeah. Sweet. Yeah, I think I've seen clips of that show. Yeah. Like uh, me and my friend do sometimes fantasize about working on like Adult Swim or something. Because we're both, oh, yeah. I guess want to be comedy writers or something. But um, I guess it wouldn't be all fantastic. And <laughs> um, like it's not like there's probably problems at like working in animation, but it's just it's such a nice, nice thought. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, he, definitely, like, it get, sounds like it gets stressful sometimes. Um, and you're interested in being a writer and, and not an animator? I think I'm a little late to... Uh, <laughs> no, it's never, late, but... never too late, Mike. Yeah, more, yes. yeah, more writing side. And um, it's just, I don't know, like, it's just like Bob's Burgers I was addicted to. It was kind mm -hmm. of my way to, like, escape during most of the 2020 mm -hmm. uh, and yeah animation is just like a different world it's just like a total total escape and it's just mm -hmm. so a thing to people yeah there's a lot of good adult cartoons these days as well yeah mm. yeah so uh talk about chickadee and your uh, upcoming project yeah chickadee um so I have an album that is 14 songs about birds coming out and each song is about a different local bird. Um, and yeah, the idea is uh, to build a relationship between kids and, and families and, and, and anyone. Cause I, I think not just kids listen to my music um, uh, between, between them and the birds that they can see when they walk out of their house. Um, and we, I started with Chickadee. Uh, that's the first single. I think Chickadees are often like a, a spark. It's called like a spark bird for people because they're very social. They're very outgoing bird, very cute. They'll land on your hand and they'll eat out of your hand. Um, so yeah, they sort of got the, uh, the, super, the more catchy song that <laughs> tried to embody the Chickadee, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, any, any, uh, have you finalized on the name of the, the album or still working? Yeah. It's called Birds Rock. First album was called Plants Rock. Uh, this one will called, be called Birds Rock. Uh, maybe one day there'll be Birds Rock too. Who knows? And, or Fungi Rocks. And yeah, maybe it'll be rock, part of a series. Rock. Go ahead. Rocks Rock. Rock, uh, Rocks Rock would be so good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I actually I I have to teach a geology class sometimes, so I I I would have like some material for that. It would hard. It'd be tough to do a whole rock album for me. I'm not gonna <laughs> lie, but the puns yeah. you could make. Oh, yeah. so many. Yeah. So um, yeah, it was a pleasure to speak to you. I'm always uh, inspired by you know unique perspectives and people in different walks of life, and uh, I yeah like before. Um, I was reached out to interview. I was uh, was thinking about how badly I could be, or how many young minds, young minds I can scar as a childhood educator as I am right now. And um, thank you so much, Pete Moss. Yeah. Oh, great to talk to you, Mike. And um, will you share this with me so I can share it around with folks? 
Awesome. Of course. Fantastic. Hope you uh, get some sun. I'm going to try to get some right now and uh, listen to the birds. Yeah, that's a good call. Yeah, pleasure. Great. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, take care.